We welcome everyone to another edition in our series, uh, Orthodox Study Bible Series, uh, and we continue in our study of uh, the Gospel of St. Uh, Matthew, and we welcome all of you who are joining us, all of you who are here uh, with us today, and uh, we will begin with the, the prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, O oh, Master who loves mankind, illumine our hearts with the pure light of your divine knowledge and open the eyes of our mind to understand the teachings of your gospel. Instill in us also the fear of your blessed commandments that we may overcome all carnal desires, entering upon a spiritual life and understanding and acting in all things according to your holy will. For you are the enlightenment of our souls and bodies, O Christ God, and to you we give glory, together with your eternal Father, your all holy, good, and gracious, and light-creating Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Christ is risen. And he is risen. <coughs> we come to this very exciting part of the Gospel of Matthew. We read last week of the uh, actual choosing from among all of the disciples that were a part of this early community, uh, this uh, community of followers of Jesus. Uh, he chooses 12, we talked about the symbolism. And one of the uh, fascinating things that Matthew uses uh, because of his mastery of his knowledge of the Old Testament and the usage of various traditions and styles uh, that are found in the New Testament, uh, or rather the Old Testament. Um, I am struck again with that admonition to be as wise as a serpent and as innocent as the dove. Uh, this is the instruction that he gives. Uh, very many times in a uh, part of the Old Testament. Now, uh, according to the practice of the Jews, the Old Testament is divided into three different sections, the Law, the Prophets, and what are called the Writings. A lot of times that third part uh, is referred to as wisdom literature. It encompasses what is called wisdom literature. Uh, wisdom literature would include the Proverbs and Ecclesiasticus and uh, the Psalms, uh, this genre of, of literature. And uh, indicative of that genre is to utilize uh, animals uh, in order uh, to uh, understand even man himself uh, it was commonplace and within the tradition of wisdom literature to believe that man will, combines in himself uh, paradoxical features of different animals. Uh, for instance, uh, symbolically uh, to be prudent uh, literally means uh, to be thoughtful, uh, to be insightful, uh, to have a uniqueness of perspective. Uh, the serpent uh, was symbolic of uh, uh, the animal who uh, had a central type of uh, knowledge of where he was going uh, and uh, direction, uh, knowledge of what he was doing. It was a certain intensity. Uh, the uh, uh, term uh, simple uh, literally means um, to be innocent to be innocent of malice, uh, the inability uh, to lie or to fabricate, to be genuine, uh, also uh, to be simplistic, uh, was a sign of uh, the missionaries to be prudent, uh, to be uh, able to clearly understand distinctly what their mission was, and who they were as individuals, as apostles, and what they were to accomplish. Uh, or, to use it in a more modern colloquialism, a clarity of purpose. We hear this a lot of times in this help 
self-help section of uh, these bookstores that we frequent a lot of times. Uh, that's what it meant uh, to be simplistic, not uh, in a negative way uh, to be uh, immature or to be uh, unknowledgeable or, or to be slow, retarded, or anything like that. Uh, this was the understanding of simplicity, to be simple. Um, our Lord calls upon the missionaries to be faultless, but yet they were called upon to exhibit uh, the simplicity that was a part of the dove. Uh, it's interesting to note that the dove uh, uh, was considered a part of uh, the sacrifice. In fact, if you remember in the Gospel of St. Luke, <clears throat> where Jesus was 40 days old, his parents take him to the temple and offer two turtle doves, okay? Uh, which is like the least expensive offer that can be made. Uh, it was offered by people who were poor, uh, who were not able to afford the other animal sacrifices. And uh, we they are offered because of their their simplicity and their gentleness, uh, which is supposed to be the characteristic that is a part of the disciples. Now, as we uh, continue on in the study of the gospel, we are in uh, Matthew chapter 10. Those of you who have the Orthodox Study Bible uh, is page 1,286. <coughs> And it is the subdivision called the encouragement to fearless witness. Remember, uh, one of the aspects of this simplicity of the dove to which we are called uh, is uh, to, to have a, a singular purpose, uh, to have a definitive, definitive mission, and a particular way we're going to accomplish that mission. In fact, to solve any problem, or to do any great thing requires that same perspective and that same need. Let's uh, continue on and beginning with verse 24, chapter 10, verse 24. It says, A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and his servant like his master. I remember uh, being in uh, college one time and I was taking a very difficult course and uh, in the syllabus uh, which you receive at the beginning which outlines what readings and what the classes are going to be and, 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 and specifically what is to be expected of you, uh, I remember a lot of us thinking, oh my god. You know, how are we going to read all this material? And it, it was a course in philosophy. And, uh, you know, some of the readings, you know, some of these philosophies, especially when you get into existentialism, you have to have like a gallon of water to drink. It's so dry and boring, boring in my opinion. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is a complex thought. And uh, we're thinking to ourselves, my God, you know, what? can we do this? And, and during the course of the semester, one of the students said, uh, asked a question, well, uh, how, uh, uh, you know, what, what would you expect of us? Well, how much are we supposed to know uh, in order to, to be able to pass this course? <laughs> and I remember the professor looking and, you know, having a kind of perplexed look. And he says, I want you to know everything that I know. <laughs> Yeah, which is basically an impossible task. But it, it, it reminds me of the, this uh, uh, admonition uh, that is given that, that uh, we are not greater than our master, we're not above our teacher, and uh, it is enough uh, for us uh, to be able to mimic uh, our master and our teacher, to emulate uh, their style and their technique and so forth, and to be able to come become true disciples of those uh, uh, professors and those teachers. He says, if they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? If you remember um, one of the accusations that the Pharisees make 
which is an ultimate blasphemy. Uh, in fact, we could even, uh, some scholars call it the sin, the ultimate sin against the Holy Spirit, uh, to be able to refer to God uh, as the prince of demons himself. Uh, to uh, have the audacity to refer to uh, Jesus and say that the only reason why he is able to expel demons is because he's the prince of the demons and kind of has power over them like a general over his subordinates, you see. Uh, so therefore, our Lord says, if they should be so audacious to think of me as Beelzebub, uh, the things that I do, as being evil, then certainly they're going to construe you uh, in the same manner. I remember in one of the uh, prophets of the Old Testament, uh, whenever they were talking about the end of days, and I don't remember exactly who it was, uh, but they gave a, a, an excellent character of what evil will, would be. And you know what they said? Uh, that the ultimate evil is to construe that which is good as evil, and that is which is evil construe as good. To kind of reverse, that is that is the ultimate evil. So therefore, if they are going to refer to me as Beelzebub, they're going to refer to you in that same capacity. They will have you in the same type of respect or ill respect as they have me. Therefore, he says, do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, and there is nothing hidden which will not be made known. In other words, uh, with the coming of the Son of God, the Son of Man in glory, uh, everything will be made manifest, just as a brilliant light. With it, you can see all of the imperfections and the dirt and grime that is a part of us, you see. This is how the coming of the Son of Man will be. That that which is done in secret, uh, that which you have proclaimed, will be made known. Or, or elsewhere, uh, later on, we, we study uh, this type of terminology, and he says, the Lord will say, what is uh, whispered uh, will be shouted from the housetops. Everything will be made manifest before the tribunal of Christ as St. Paul says. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And whatever you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul. In other words, uh, there are two deaths. There is physical death, and according to the teaching of our Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, there is another death, there is spiritual death. And uh, with physical death, if we believe in Christ, if we accept his teaching through this apostolic, ritual, uh, this apostolic preaching, then what happens as a gift, we receive eternal life, you see. But if we do not, we allow ourselves to die spiritually and to those who are spiritually dead as we talked about earlier in the gospel are like the dried uh, branches that no longer bear fruit what do you do you get an accent you cut it off and furthermore to be further dramatic you take those sticks and burn it in the fireplace that becomes the means by which you have a blazing fire. You don't start with a big uh, log and stick a match to it, right? You start with little twigs. And then after you get that bustling, you throw on the logs and so forth and have a large fire. So uh, therefore, uh, he uh, tells us that uh, uh, whatever uh, is to be done, whatever is heard, uh, the disciples, what they hear, uh, to preach and to preach boldly, uh, to not hold back, and to preach it and, and speak in the light, speak openly, speak bravely, speak uh, with that 
certain prudence and, and with a sense of direction and, and singular purpose, that simplicity that we talked about before. And uh, do not fear uh, those who can kill the body. Do not fear those persecutors that can kill your physical body, but rather fear only him who can not only uh, uh, cause the destruction of body, but also our souls. Okay? Uh, this is the one to whom uh, we should fear. Uh, are not the sparrows sold for a copper coin? And yet not one of them falls to the ground apart from your Father's will. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. And do not fear, therefore, for you are of far greater value than any sparrow. You see, uh, the, this most simplistic of animals, if God cares for and God knows God's all-perceiving knowledge for even a sparrow, whenever they die, they fall to the ground, God knows, God wills, okay? And even the number of our hair, this is, this is done in order uh, to give a parabolic or a symbolic uh, extreme knowledge that God has of each and every one of us intimately, you see, and the tremendous value that he gives to us and cares for us. If he's able to care for some insignificant sparrow, you know, the, the least of birds, if you will, uh, should not he be more concerned with us, okay? So that even the hairs of our head are numbered. Uh, the intensity of God's knowledge of all things. There is no limit to his knowledge. Uh, there is no limit to his ability to comprehend and to see. He sees and hears all things. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me for, before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Uh, this is the same kind of style that we saw earlier, the same type of logic that we saw earlier the Lord using when he was talking about the forgiveness of sin, when he was talking about the Lord's Prayer. Uh, your uh, capacity of being forgiven uh, by God is dependent on your willingness to forgive other people. So that on the last day, uh, which we are all preparing, uh, which the apostles prepare us for through their preaching and through their witness and through their teaching, uh, on that last day, the Lord says that ultimately uh, righteousness or justification or salvation is to be acknowledged by God. You see? Uh, do not we function in the same way whenever, uh, you know, at this time of year uh, we're inundated with college and high school graduations? Well, is that not what a graduation is? An acknowledgement? You are called by name to receive the reward for which you have worked and prepared is an acknowledgement. Whenever you congratulate someone, it's an acknowledgement. So therefore, on the last day, in order before we enter into the fullness of God's kingdom, we will be acknowledged by God. In fact, in the 28th chapter of this same gospel, uh, the uh, parable of the last judgment, you have Jesus even saying to those on the right side, enter into the fullness of the kingdom that has been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You see, uh, a, a, an actual personal acknowledgement, in fact, uh, indicative of, of even the worship of the church, uh, whenever we receive the holy mysteries, uh, we are always communed by name. You see, not like in the Western Church, Corpus Christi, you know, body of Christ, amen. 
the servant of God, Joe or Mary or whatever the name may be. In fact, uh, uh, it is proper to use our Christian name when receiving a blessing or when receiving the Holy Eucharist and not, you know, a more common name. Uh, uh, you know, I, I remember uh, one time uh, there was a wedding that it was uh, called to uh, to sing at and everyone uh, knew the, who, what would be the groom. Uh, they all knew him uh, by uh, a nickname, which is was kind of silly and whenever uh, he was being married he wanted the priest to use his nickname like Skippy or whatever you know some silly thing like that and of course the priest refused uh, when you are crowned in marriage you use your Christian or your proper name you see so therefore it's a part of that acknowledgement that whoever acknowledges me in this world uh, by professing faith in Him, uh, by uh, remaining faithful to Him. Uh, in fact, uh, <clears throat> many times, <clears throat> if you read uh, a lot of Russian literature, uh, many times as the last act of faith that these uh, new martyrs of Russia did, simply make the sign of the cross. See? It's an acknowledgement of who and what we are and what we stand for. So those of us who are prepared to formally and 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 with all of our uh, ability to acknowledge Christ in our lives, even in the face of of persecution, God will acknowledge in His kingdom. If we are not willing to do this, then we are not worthy. We are not worthy of entering into that kingdom. Let's continue on. Our Lord says something uh, rather strange. Okay. And I remember I, I started reading the Bible when I was about eight, nine years old. And I remember reading this for the first time. It, it, it kind of blew my mind. And it really wasn't until I went to seminary and actually started studying the scripture more intently that it kind of made sense and it, it was a little little alarming for me our lord says in verse uh, chapter 10 verse 34 he says do not think that i came to bring peace on the earth i do not come to bring peace but a sword uh, on saint thomas sunday a few weeks ago one of the first things Jesus says, peace be with you. Uh, even uh, again, at the end of that same gospel, peace uh, be with you. Uh, uh, he says elsewhere in the gospel, my peace I, I leave with you that no one could take away. Uh, Christ is peace, even in the Beatitudes, remember? A few chapters, blessed are the peacemakers. Well, then what is happening here? And I think that the, the best way to understand is that although the Lord is peace, and by accepting uh, uh, Him is to receive peace, however, sometimes to be able to accept Him comes at a tremendous price. Sometimes we have to be at war with ourselves and our sinfulness. Sometimes we are called upon to repent. And a lot of uh, times in monastic literature, this repentance, this metanoia, is, is understood as an ongoing battle. You know, we're, we're, <clears throat> there are many Christians today who feel that to get into to, to heaven is just like buying a ticket at, the, uh, at a ticket counter. They just, woof. You just kind of go right in. No. Rather, uh, the, the choice many times is going to require battle. Uh, it's going to require a war within ourselves and uh, warring against our passions and our sins. Uh, it also uh, is going to involve uh, our sacrifice. Uh, the sacrifice of our time and our talent, our money, the sacrifice of our will, 
all of these things come at a cost and can be rightfully understood as waging war against the world. In fact, he's even going to be more dramatic, and we're going to see as we continue on forward exactly what kind of uh, uh, sword uh, that uh, he brings. Uh, with the coming of Christ in our lives, <clears throat> as I said before, it is a dramatic entity. It's like we talked about before, when you have a hot air mass and a cold air coming together, what happens? Boom! You have thunder, you have lightning. It's, it's, it's a traumatic, catastrophic, catastrophic thing. And with the Lord's miracles and with His teaching, as I said before, with this usherance of the kingdom of God, a, a dramatic, tremendous thing is happening, not only in the world, you see, but now it is happening in our lives. It calls for a catharsis. It calls for, for a change to, at many times, involves war. War with evil. Okay? Uh, I remember in the Gospel of St. Luke, uh, whenever the Annunciation uh, is made by the Archangel Gabriel to the Holy Mother of God, the Virgin Mary, uh, uh, they present him to the temple on the 40th day, and uh, whenever uh, Simeon holds in his hands the Christ child and utters what is called the Simeon Prayer, uh, o Lord, now let your servant depart in peace. In Russian, the Nanyo uh, uh, Um He says something to the Mother of God that this child is destined for the rise and fall of many in Israel. See? And as a sign, a sword shall pierce your heart. See? Okay? Remember before? What was Jesus talking about? Father be, being betrayed by a son, sons betraying their mm -hmm. father. You see, this is what this 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 gospel happens in a sinful world. It it rocks it to the core, and it will call for a sword in order to do battle to be able to enter into that kingdom. Let's continue further. Our Lord says, For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. So intense is uh, this coming of the kingdom and the gospel that it will cause division even in families. In fact, if we read our church history and we read the lives of the saints, the, the various biographical hagiography that is a part of our church, many, many times we see this happening uh, in the families of, of, of saints, uh, turning each other in, uh, turning them uh, over to the persecutors, to the civil authorities in order to escape uh, punishment themselves, you see? Uh, so this is something that happens many, many times. And you know what? Uh, even pastorally, let me share with you this. There are many times that even in one family, a husband is not a believer, the father is not a believer, but yet the, the, the mother the children are, or vice versa. I remember one family I had in my first church, uh, the little boy told me that he's the one that wakes up mommy and daddy and tells them, I want to go to church. Where the parents are just, it was just handy dandy, just laying in you know, bed and sleeping in on Sunday. After all, that's the only day we get to sleep in. <laughs> see, we work all the time, you see. It was a child. Seven-year-old kid. That's a you wake up. I want to go to church. Or he used to call his grandma 
I said, take me to church, pick me up. You see? You see? Even within the family, there's inconsistency. Uh, in fact, I, I, I know some families where, where uh, a, 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 another uh, one of the fellow people in, in the family um, even ridicule religion and laugh at religion in order to dissuade people in the family from believing. It happens. And as a result, uh, we have to remain faithful. And, and to stay faithful means using that sword. Being willing to, to give up uh, whatever it costs to follow Jesus. Uh, elsewhere in the gospel we read, if your right hand causes your sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. You know, it's better to enter the, world, the kingdom blind and lame than not enter at all. You see the logic? Okay, this is a this is kind of a foretaste of here. What is what is to come? So that even in the in, in 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 even in the household, there can be dissension, and often is. Um, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake, he will find it. This is a very, very powerful, dramatic utterance of the Lord. Uh, and he reminds us that the fourth priority in our life is to follow God. If we place every need of, of uh, other people before, even if they're a family, before our devotion to God, we're not worthy of them. When he says, seek first the kingdom, he literally means it. Choose that first then everything else falls into place. So that uh, whenever uh, we as Christians, you know, sometimes we're, 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 we're going to have to uh, put off family members and be more concerned about pleasing the Lord rather than living up to their, you know, uh, agnostic kind of philosophies and, and, and so forth. Okay? Uh, to... Uh, be worthy of Him uh, means uh, that we place Him first in our lives. And He calls upon His disciples to take up the cross and to follow Him, uh, to be able to, to suffer any atrocity. And one can only imagine hearing these words by those original apostles and disciples and those first century uh, people who followed utterly having goosebumps stunned of this concept of following the cross the cross was an ancient way of not only death but torture uh, so gruesome was uh, crucifixion that in the Roman world, if you were a citizen of Rome, no matter what heinous crime you committed, you still weren't bad enough to be crucified. The crucifixion was reserved for non-citizens and especially for the worst of criminals, the, de de the, the most degenerate criminal, you see. So therefore, you, you have no more of a dramatic imagery of the cost to be a disciple than that, to be willing to die. And of course, as I said before, Jesus practices what he preaches, right? And we will see within him and within his divine human character, willingness to follow his own advice, willing to be obedient to his own words, to be able to give up his life. And as St. Paul said, he so loved us that he was willing to die, even death on the cross, because of his love for us. 
So therefore, like he said, no one's greater than their master. No one knows more than the teacher. Okay? So therefore, uh, if this is what the Lord, uh, what happens to him, we may and can expect the same type of thing. Uh, to be willing to suffer anything is worth being able to enter into the kingdom. It is worth being acknowledged by Christ. And this is something, this next section, uh, and a lot of times I, I repeated it to my children and, and uh, also to my spiritual children, to my parishioners. Uh, he who wants to find his life will lose it. You know, how sophisticated we have become. We have all of these self-help books and we are given the impression that it, if we want to better ourselves, all we have to do is buy the proper book or go to the proper therapist or, or do the proper thing and everything's going to be fine. And we're deluded by that philosophy. Because the only peace and the only salvation and healing that we get comes from God. It comes from the Lord. And those who would do so many different things in order to save their life will lose it. Okay? You'll lose it. Many times our young students in college are tempted away from the faith by Christian existentialism. There's no such thing. And these other philosophies and 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 other other ways of thinking and so forth, and they do it because they're enlightened. You know, they're going to become better. They're going to become richer. They're going to become more powerful. They're going to become more influential. Well, if that is your sole desire, you'll lose. How is the only way to find salvation? is by losing our life for the sake of the Lord and His Gospel. Because only in losing ourselves in Christ will we be fine safe. Will we be, will we be safe? Will we, will, we will be saved. Okay? And I think that's a very profound thing. He who would find his life will lose it. Why? Because he's doing it on his own. We forget a lot of times what our Lord said, without me, you can do nothing. And I'll take it one step further, if, you, if you'll permit. Not only can we do nothing, we are nothing without Him. And that is the first thing we have to learn in order to be saved. We can't save ourselves. Only Christ can save, not us. And it's only by losing ourselves by sacrificing our complete self in Christ, will we be found and will we be saved? Uh, a lot of times in the liturgical ritual uh, of our church, and we, we, we see this especially in uh, monastic tonsures uh, or ordinations where we have this 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 prostration in the form of a cross on the floor. This is, this is symbolic of giving up of oneself, of dying in order to rise to a new life. Okay? In fact, even uh, in the baptism itself, when we are immersed, Paul tells us in the Romans, when we are immersed into the water, we partake of Christ's death. We put on the cross and the effectiveness of the cross. And when we rise out of that tomb, uh, we partake or, or we have upon ourselves the power of the resurrection. We are able to become one in Christ through our baptism and uh, also through our chrismation. This, this die, 
this dying. And this is exactly what Jesus meant when we die to the world, yet shall we live. And even if we live and die, we shall live again. You see. So uh, this taking upon the cross, this willingness to die, this, this ultimate willingness to lose ourselves, to lose our, our arrogance and sinfulness, to die completely, only then will we be able to be saved. He says further, He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Uh, the work of the apostles and the work of their successors, uh, since they are doing the very work of Christ himself, uh, those who receive them, those who are receptive to their message, actually receive Christ himself. Okay? And they receive uh, his teaching and the fullness of himself. And this is the beginning of our salvation. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. Okay? If we receive someone uh, in the name of Christ, we will receive the reward of that person who uh, is in Christ. Uh, we will become shares of that same salvation. St. Paul says it very beautifully when he tells Christians in various uh, churches that he started, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. Because ultimately, uh, when we follow him, we were made one with him. And by following uh, the apostles, by following uh, their uh, successors through ordination, uh, we are actually, uh, when we receive them, we receive Christ. And we receive his actual message and the actual saving grace. And just as uh, they have a share in the reward, so we also shall share in that reward on the last day. Whoever receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive the righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall be by no means lost, he shall by no means lose his reward. Even to give a cup of water in the name of Christ, a cup of water which was considered a natural act of hospitality, okay uh, a, a cup of water uh, you know even 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 the, the gospel itself is water it is refreshment it is nourishment uh, that is needed uh, in order to sustain us so that anyone who is willing to participate uh, in the spread of this gospel and to give this 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 water will receive a tremendous reward and God's reward, God's blessings are given to anyone and given for even the smallest thing. There will be a great reward. Okay? So we see the, the absolute majesty of God and we receive, we, we are able to see the, the absolute gratefulness of God. Again, He practices what He preaches. If he wants us to be grateful, it, it, it is because it ref, it's a reflection of him, you see? Uh, to be able to reward even the most simplest of things will be blessed and be, will, will be rewarded by the Lord when he comes in the fullness of that. Okay? Let's continue on. Well, actually, uh, why don't we just stop here? because we're going to begin uh, another chapter in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11. And uh, we can continue in that uh, Bible study next week. Uh, we'll continue in chapter 11, verse 1, because there are different themes that uh, will be discussed in, at that time. Are there any questions online? Uh, no, no.
pleasure being on. Anyone have any questions? Something to share today? Okay. Well, we again thank all of you for being here and uh, for joining us in this Bible study. And we invite you to come back uh, next week again and join us again and to invite your family and your friends and uh, study the Word of God and thus uh, come closer to Him and be able to get to know Him and know His will and the sanctifying grace that comes with accepting Him. Even the willingness to take up the cross and to follow Him no matter where He takes us because ultimately the only way to be saved is to lose our life for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of the Lord. Okay, uh, let's stand and we will offer the final prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Shine, shine, O Lord Jerusalem, for the glory, glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Exalt and rejoice, O Zion. And you, pure Mother of God, rejoice in the resurrection of your Son. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Christ is risen.